Thank you, Kurt. And I also want to thank Jenny and uh, Dean Bohr for inviting me up here to, to speak. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to see the audience. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start by uh, taking my jacket off. Uh, I was uh, lucky enough to be uh, an author on um, the, one of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessments. Um, and as part of the author team, I was from the Washington, D.C. office of USDA, and I was from the chief economist office. And I realized uh, halfway through that the other scientists were calling me the suit. And I was naive enough to kind of think that that was a compliment. Uh, <laughs> but I've learned over time. And looking out at this audience, I'm going to go ahead and lose the jacket. Uh, again, my name is Bill Hohenstein. I'm uh, the director of our climate change program at USDA. I've been in this position now for 15 years. And uh, I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground today. Uh, I've got 45 minutes, which seems like a lot of time, but I'm sure it's going to fly by. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is talk a little bit about some of the issues that aren't covered in terms of cli the climate science itself and what we know and, and, and what we expect to happen over the next 30, 40, 50 years. I'm going to talk about the role of agriculture and, and what we mean by climate smart, because it is a little bit of jargon, um, but it's an attempt to try to compress and compile a whole range of important issues that are important for agriculture. And then finally, uh, I'm going to talk about the work that we have going on at USDA uh, to position not just the department, but US agriculture to deal with these challenges that we're going to face. And so let's go ahead and dive into it. So hopefully this will work. So first, let me just start by kind of teeing this up. What do we mean when we talk about climate smart agriculture? Well, we're trying to essentially optimize several things all at once. First, we have to recognize that if we're going to meet continued emerging demand for agricultural products as the world increases in population from 7 billion people to 9.5 billion people, as those people become more wealthy and demand more and different types of agricultural products, we're going to need to increase production. Now, that can happen a lot of different ways. We can either extensify agriculture, moving into more land. Uh, in developing countries, that means resulting in deforestation and increasing the use of, of resources as inputs to production. Or we can intensify production. We can do that sustainably. And it turns out that there's a real link between how we improve productivity, how we improve production practices, our ability to meet uh, continued emerging demand, and the implication that has on the environment. And so that's an important component of this climate smart philosophy. The second is to realize that the climate is changing, and I'm going to get into that a little bit, maybe reinforcing some of Art's points. Um, but in order to meet that emerging demand, we're going to need to ensure that we are resilient to that change as agriculture. And that means a lot of things for a lot of people and a lot of different farmers, uh, because each situation is unique, and how climate change manifests itself over the landscape is going to be very different, uh, depending on where you are. And then finally, we need to recognize as an industry that we have a role in all of this. Um, globally, agriculture is responsible for somewhere around 15% of emissions. In the US, it's actually less, significantly less, about 7%. But still, we have a significant greenhouse gas footprint, and we have a responsibility to be part of that solution. In addition, there are a lot of things we can do that make economic sense, that make uh, broader uh, sense to farmers that can also reduce emissions and increase carbon sequestration. So we have a role to play there. And that's also part of this climate smart philosophy. But first, I was going to talk a little bit about climate change itself and maybe reinforce some of Art's points. And the climate is, is clearly changing. I think we have multiple lines of evidence when, when we talk to the scientists, folks like Art, that we can see it in the record. We see it in the data. In fact, just over the last four decades, each decade has been warmer than the last. And in fact, the warmest year on record is now 2014. You know, there's been a lot of news stories about, you know, have we seen a pause in warming? Has warming slowed? Um, 14 of the 15 warmest years have happened just recently. You know, before 2014, 2010 and 2005 were the warmest years. Um, so there, the, the trends in terms of warming are happening. We're seeing it. It's connected to the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. I think there's very clear scientific evidence that greenhouse gases contribute to radiative forcing and that the patterns of warming we're seeing 
are connected to the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So what that means? Well, certainly farmers are seeing change. We've seen uh, increases in average temperature across the U.S. of about a, a degree. Um, and, and farmers are adapting to those changes. We've seen longer growing season. We're seeing wetter springs in, in the Northeast and the Midwest. Um, just over the last decade, we've seen a whole string of, of, of wetter springs. And so farmers in the Midwest have moved to uh, increasing tile drainage. Um, and then 2012 hit, and we had suddenly a different situation in the Midwest. But across the board, you can see farmers changing production practices, looking at what they're seeing on the ground, looking at the changes that they're seeing, and adapting. But that adaptation is happening reactively. It, farmers are reacting to what they're seeing on the ground. And so far, that's worked. You know, we're, agriculture production in the US is strong. Our ag economy is strong. Um, but we're seeing about 0.2 degrees of warming per decade. And farmers are accommodating those kinds of changes. What we expect to see over the next century is quite different. You know, if we're on that red line that, that Art pointed out, um, not only are we going to see an absolute increase in total, the total volume over quantity of warming, but the rate of change is going to accelerate. And so we're going to see warming of 0.6 to 0.8 degrees per decade. And at that point, reactive adaptation, reacting to what you're seeing on the ground and trying to accommodate that, is not going to work. Farmers are going to need to be more proactive. We that are interested in agriculture are going to need to be more proactive in terms of providing farmers with the advice and guidance they need to stay ahead of what we expect to see as a very changing world over the next century. And so Art actually presented the same set of slides, which you know, one way of thinking about it is the entire climate distribution, and there really are. There are warm years and cold years and warm seasons and dry seasons. There's a lot of variability that already exists within the climate system. That's all going to be shifting, and it's going to be shifting in a fairly predictable way. Um, in addition, you know, we're looking at things like extremes, and, and Art pulled out for the Northeast the same set of scenarios that are presented here um, and showed that in the Northeast, you know, we do expect to see some increase in extremely high temperatures, but not a dramatic amount. But if you look at the Southwest, a region of the country we're also interested in here in USDA, um, where they're going to get hit with um, a, a much higher rate of temperatures with over 100 degrees, which is re what's represented on this, this slide. And we expect to see drier temperatures as well. And so in the Northeast, the effects of climate change may be longer growing seasons, maybe milder winters, more extreme precipitation, more rainfall overall. In some other regions of the country, in California, in the southwest, in the southern plains, in parts of the southeast, where you don't need a whole lot of additional warming, and you don't, growing seasons aren't necessarily an issue, we're going to see maybe some of the more dramatic effects of, of climate change. Um, we've done a lot of economic analysis now of what we expect these effects to be, and um, just put out a recent climate assessment. And in doing that, um, our, our, the economist that worked on that said, you know what we've been assuming? We've been assuming that the climate change is going to be well behaved. And increasingly we know that's not likely to be the case. That in addition to these average rates of warming and these shifts in the distribution of temperature, we also expect to see changes in the probabilities of extreme events. And I think Art's right to say you can't kind of pin any one event to climate change, or it's difficult to do. I know folks are looking at California right now. They're looking at the 2012 drought. You know, you look at, at 2010 globally, and this is a really interesting situation because in, in Russia, we had some of the driest and hottest temperatures on record there. They lost 20% of their wheat crop. Basically, much of it burned. At the same time that that was happening in Pakistan, we had some of the greatest flooding that they've seen on record with over 1.4 million acres inundated. And this was all in the month of July in, in 2010. And so if we're looking just at average temperatures and changes in what we expect to see on the average year, we're going to be missing a lot of the impacts on agriculture if we're not focused on extreme events. And so bringing it back to this meeting, you know, livestock is not immune. 
Certainly, we need to be feeding our, our, our livestock, and to the effect that these changes in temperature affect feed, grain, and forage, they're going to affect the cost of production, and they're going to affect the reliability of, of feed. In addition, animals are a lot like humans. You know, when it gets too hot out, they tend to not do so well. They tend to produce less. They tend to increase mortality. So we've, you know, as part of our last assessment, we worked with the dairy industry on this heat stress chart looking at the relationship between temperature and humidity and, and uh, production. Um, in addition, we're worried about uh, changes in the diseases and pests, not just where they exist, but the, their timing and extent and distribution. So there are a number of things where we're looking at livestock um, vulnerabilities and effects on production. In addition, you know, for an area region like the Northeast, we might be seeing reductions in winter mortality and, and you know, improvements in conditions with winter if we see wild, milder winters, and that's part of the story as well. So I'm going to shift now to what we can do about it, both as an industry, as USDA, and as, as farmers, and, and options for building resilience. And there are certainly options within the livestock sector. There are breeds of cows, breeds of livestock that are they're more heat tolerant, um, we can look at nutritional needs and, and feed regimes during warm temperatures and which ones do best. Um, we can have engineering solutions, which include barn cooling, uh, shading, evaporative cooling for, for livestock. Uh, we can look at rotational grazing and the effect that that has on minimizing some of the effects on pasture. Um, and then looking at herd management over time, especially if we can do a better job at anticipating short-term climate variability and things like drought. On the crop side, again, it's breeding for tolerance. We're working with Monsanto and Syngenta and Pioneer on ensuring that drought tolerance is a priority and heat tolerance is a priority in, in, in our genetics program. Um, providing advice on, on plant dates, um, being, being ahead of the game in terms of providing uh, ad, advice on timing. Um, uh, soil management and soil health, and I'm going to get into that in a, a minute can really help build resilience within cropping systems. Um, and then good conservation practices generally help build resilience to all sorts of extremes within, within cropping systems. Water is a, a critical resource, um, and it's going to be an acute uh, uh, concern for many regions of the country in the Northeast. Maybe not as much as other regions, but you know, there, are, there are areas of New York that were affected in 2012 by the drought. And we, as we expect to see more extremes and more, and the relationship between high temperatures and soil moisture, water management across the board is going to be more important. Developing uh, efficient irrigation systems, thinking about water storage, um, all of these things are going to be an important part of our portfolio of actions. Um, you know, again, kind of taking arts caution in mind that you can't tie any one event to climate change. Um, 2012 across the Corn Belt and across parts of the Northeast was a real wake-up call for a lot of farmers. Um, and we've done a retrospective. We've looked at what worked and what didn't, how farmers fared, both from a production standpoint and from an economic standpoint. And we learned some really important lessons. I think first has to do with conservation and soil health. Farmers that had high organic matter, that had good conservation practices, that practiced no-till, um, had better water retention, and better water retention meant better production in that year. And it was, it was clear across the board, this is a case in Indiana where these are essentially farms side by side, where one farmer was, uh, had been practicing continuous no-till and his neighbor was, a, was more of a con conventional farmer. Um, but in many cases in 2012, tillage and soil health wasn't enough. Um, having proper irrigation systems in place made a difference. It was one of the few years where um, corn uh, yields in Nebraska exceeded corn yields in Iowa, which is kind of rare. And it was all due to the fact that, uh, that corn production in Nebraska is primarily irrigated. And so farmers that were irrigating had irrigation in place did better in, in 2012. Um, genetics made a difference. Uh, we compared our yields in 2012 to the yields in, in 1998, which is the last time we had a drought that was anywhere near that. And what we found was the strengthening of the corn and the soybean crops that have been done primarily through genetic improvements um, led to stronger root systems, uh, 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 stronger plants, and 
we actually were able to produce crops in many regions in 2012 where that wouldn't have been possible in 1998. And so, um, you know, the genetic component of this is really important. And then finally, crop insurance. And I realize that I'm talking to livestock producers, you know, the, the, the need to have a safety net for farmers when things are bad is really critical, and that turned out to make a difference for a lot of crop farmers uh, in 2012. So shifting gears a little bit from adaptation and resilience to, to our role in, in, uh, as a source of greenhouse gas emissions, if you look at the profile of emissions across the U.S., the U.S. emits about 6.6 .6 million tons of CO2 a year. Roughly 6 to 7% of that come from agriculture. Um, in addition, forests are a significant offset, and agriculture is a pretty modest offset um, through carbon sequestration. So we, as a country, about 12 to 15 percent of our emissions each year are re-sequestered in, in lands. Looking within agriculture, um, livestock and grazing are responsible for a little more than half of total emissions with a fair chunk coming from ruminant and turk fermentation, a chunk coming from manure management, and a chunk coming from N2O emissions from grazing lands. The remainder comes primarily from the, the cultivation of legumes and fertilizer use as well as energy use. And so that's sort of the profile of, of where agricultural emissions come from and helps define where there are opportunities to reduce emissions. So looking specifically within livestock, um, beef cattle is the major source and that's primarily because there are just more beef cattle. Um, dairy, the emissions are significant but distributed pretty evenly between uh, manure management and enteric fermentation. Um, swine is also a pretty significant source, but primarily from the manure management side. So where are there opportunities to reduce emissions? Um, we have a lot of work to do to understand ruminant emissions and, and how we can reduce ruminant emissions. Um, we're working with the Dairy Management Institute on what they're calling the cow of the future, um, essentially ways of improving feed efficiency Getting more product per unit of feed means reducing waste, and that ends up reducing methane emissions from the cow itself. And that you know, gets to things like not just the genetics of the cow, but also digestibility of, of forages and feeds, uh, and ways to work within um, within um, the the uh, the uh, rumen itself in terms of you know the bacteria that are there. So there's a lot of research that's going on. Some of this is proving to be beneficial, but we have a lot of more work to do. On the manure side, and I've got to apologize, um, especially to my NRCS counterparts out here, um, they remind me constantly that manure is not waste. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. Um, it's a resource. Um, so uh, uh, here, I think we know where the sources are coming from, and we know we have a number of technical options that can, can reduce the profile uh, when it comes to methane emissions from manure. And there's going to be a lot of talk about digesters, and digesters can be part of the solution, and they can work very well on farms, but they're certainly not the only thing that can be done. Um, covering uh, anaerobic lagoons uh, can be effective with flaring. Um, solid separation, reducing the amount of solids that are going into the lagoons themselves, reduces the organic you know, material in the lagoons and reduces methane emissions. And combining that with compost can be an effective strategy. So there are a number of things that farmers can do, realizing that digesters, while they can be part of the, the, the portfolio, they're certainly not going to work on every farm and every operation. Um, so let me start to wrap up by talking about what we're, what we're doing within the department. And I don't know how many of you have ever seen Secretary Vilsack talk or kind of met him, um, he's passionate about this issue. Um, and the reason why he's so passionate about it is that he views our role at USDA as being the protectors of agriculture. We're, our mission is to ensure continued food production for the U.S. and continued economic viability for farmers and rural communities. And he's very serious about that. And in that context, looking at climate change and the risks and vulnerabilities that farmers are facing, he really wants the department to be proactive in both addressing the issue in terms of positioning our programs to manage those risks and to work with farmers on 
on both the mitigation and the adaptation components of that. And so we have a number of efforts underway across the department to help position our programs and to work with farmers. And the first of these, he announced in April, a set of building blocks for climate smart agriculture and forestry. Um, related to that, we're working with our Department of Energy and the Environmental Protection Agency on a biogas roadmap. And then finally, uh, just in the last year, we've announced a series of regional climate hubs. And one of those hubs is located in the Northeast. Um, there are three locations uh, in, in Durham, New Hampshire, here at Cornell, and at University Park in, in, in Pennsylvania. And there's gonna be a session tomorrow. I think uh, Howard Skinner is somewhere here. Howard. All right, he's gonna be talking about our efforts in the Northeast through our, our regional climate hub there to, to support farmers. So what are these building blocks? Um, well, they fit within the broader administration strategy to combat climate change. Um, we're hurtling toward a major international climate meeting that's gonna happen in Paris this November. Uh, this is part of the ongoing UN climate change negotiations that have been occurring since 1992 and have fostered things like the Kyoto Protocol. We're now um, in the midst of creating an agreement that will go from 2015 through 2025, and it will involve all countries. Um, as you're probably aware, the U.S. never ratified the Kyoto Protocol. It, it didn't work for us, and it didn't work for us in part because it didn't include all countries. And so countries like Brazil and India and China didn't have responsibilities under, uh, under the Kyoto Protocol, and that it wasn't very flexible. And so this challenge that we have ahead of us is how to bring all countries together so all countries have a stake in, in addressing climate change and they all have capacity to reduce emissions. And so the president has made a commitment to reduce U.S. emissions by somewhere between 26 to 28 percent by 2025. Um, and the secretary on hearing that said, okay, well, what are we going to do within USDA? And what capacities do we have? And so we worked through our programs, through our conservation and renewable energy programs, and we came up with this portfolio of building blocks that the secretary announced in April. Now, we had a certain kind of construct for these. We wanted to work within our programs, and that means being voluntary and incentive-based to work with farmers through our system of cooperative conservation to be focused on the benefits to farmers. This isn't gonna work if farmers don't see economic and, and, and real benefits to their production practices. Um, we need to be um, serious about quantifying our benefits. Um, if we're gonna convince other countries to take action, we have to be able to demonstrate that those actions are effective. And so measuring and monitoring our success is a critical component of this effort. And then finally, we recognize that we're not gonna be able to do it just as USDA. Uh, we have a lot of resources through are the, you know, the Title II of the Farm Bill or conservation title through the energy title. But if we're gonna be effective at, at something this large, we're gonna to need to work with industry, we're gonna to need to work with farm groups and, and the commodity uh, groups and, and the universities as well in doing this. So what are these 10 building blocks? Well, a number of them focus on crop agriculture. So we have a soil health uh, building block which really focuses on conservation tillage and no-till. We have pretty uh, uh, serious goals to almost double the rate of conservation tillage and no-till, to double the use of winter cover crops. Um, we have a, a building block focused on nutrient stewardship and nitrogen stewardship, uh, seeking to reduce nitrous oxide emissions from croplands by 10% over the next decade. We want to work with the livestock sector. We have an ongoing partnership with the dairy industry and DMI that we want to expand on and, and, and build again with the other critical livestock uh, sectors, beef and, and swine. We have a goal of installing another 500 digesters over the course of the next 10 years, and that is really ambitious. Um, right now we have just around 200 digesters total on farms. Um, in the last year, I think USDA supported the installation of another four digesters. And so we have some work to do to actually move forward in this area. Um, and, and the 500 digesters is, it's a goal, it's a number. We may have a smaller number of larger digesters. We may decide that we've got other technologies such as lagoon covers and solid separation that can achieve the same end. 
but it's a pretty ambitious goal over the next 10 years. Um, working through our CRP and our other uh, uh, conservation programs to set aside sensitive lands or some lands that are best put in, in conservation and those can have significant carbon sequestration benefits and working on pasture lands uh, to, do, to implement practices such as rotational grazing and ways of building organic matter in pasture lands the same way we do with, with cropland soils. And then finally, a whole series of forestry activities that I'm not going to get into in any detail. And the last one focusing on our role is in, in rural development to uh, build um, uh, energy efficiency, energy generation, and renewable energy. Um, we have a lot of capacity there uh, to work with, with uh, rural landowners, but also the industry um, on expanding renewables. So part of the renewable strategy is this biogas roadmap, and this is broader than agriculture. It includes um, landfills, it includes the food sector, food waste, um, working with our counterparts at DOE and EPA. We have a detailed strategy to use our authorities to promote the development of, of biogas uh, uh, strategies, including digesters, and it's a real opportunity. It, I think of it as a strategy that shines the spotlight on on this as a set of technologies and really can mobilize resources across the government um, to help folks that are, that are interested in pursuing these technologies. Um, and again, the, the goals here, they're government-wide and they're very ambitious, but they, they think that the potential is huge. Um, and then finally, our climate hubs. And this gets back to our role in helping position farmers to deal with climate variability and climate change. And this whipped through very quickly. Um, our hub in the northeast, um, again, is located in Durham uh, and with, with partnerships with Cornell and, and, uh, and uh, uh, U University Park in Pennsylvania. Um, this effort really recognizes that we have tremendous capacity to work with farmers across the country at USDA. We have offices in virtually every rural county, 3,000 counties across the country. We have NRCS state offices, we have NRCS uh, county offices, we have FSA offices, we have rural development offices at the state and local level. All of these folks deal with farmers on a da daily basis. None of these folks know a heck of a lot about climate change, um, but the capacity is there to work with farmers. And so what the hubs are really trying to do at their core is take what we know through our research and our science program and integrate it into our delivery system integrated into extension, integrated into our, our conservation delivery system. It's a huge challenge, but the opportunities are great. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel and create a new infrastructure that's going to reach out to farmers directly on climate change. What we're trying to do is build that capacity to integrate climate change into the broader portfolio of services that we provide to farmers and rural landowners. And we're off to a good start. Um, you know, I've been, you're going to hear from, from Howard on to sort of what's going on. Oh, boy, that was my take-home slide. Um, uh, on, on what they're up to in the Northeast, we've set up some national objectives. We want each regional hub to create a regional climate assessment, and that's been done for the Northeast, so you can go on their website and, and read the Northeast Vulnerability Assessment. Um, we want them to build a coalition, and the Northeast has done an excellent job in engaging um, the land-grant universities. Um, we want them to inventory what we have now and what we need in terms of priorities. And then finally, um, begin to make the connections in terms of how this is going to work programmatically. Um, we have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, you know, I just met with folks from Cornell this morning on this. Um, resources are certainly an issue. Um, this is a priority for the secretary, but we're, we're really committed to not this in the short term, but really building this capacity in the long term. And so finally, here, let me end with this. Um, you know, there's a lot to be worried about. You know, those first set of slides on climate change and what we expect over the next century, it can be daunting and kind of depressing, in fact. Um, but when you think about farmers and agriculture, farmers are resilient and farmers are adaptable. You know, this is a farmer from Turkey. Um, the advantage we have in the U.S. is that we have a strong history of partnership between the government, between the commodity groups and farmers through extension to make sure that farmers have access to the latest information, the latest technology, the latest capacity, and that they can be proactive in how we manage risks and vulnerabilities. And we're going to need that over the next century. So let me stop here. 
Um, you may have some questions. Hopefully Art can answer the questions on climate change and I can answer the questions about our programs.